You're a working man. You're a railroad man. A man who works with his hands and his head. Shortly, you'll begin to develop skills and work habits that only experience can give you. special care that one of the habits you develop is that of doing your work the safe way. You'll save a lot of time and prevent accidents. Remember, railroading takes a team effort. You're part of a team. You're not operating by yourself. You're working to see to it that other men stay safe, too. You use a variety of tools, hand tools and power tools. Use them safely, and they'll help you do your work. Use them the wrong way, and they can hurt you. Take the adze, for example. The adze is a sharp tool that can cut you seriously if improperly used. When you're leveling the bearing surface for tie plates, take a firm stance, legs separated. Safety goggles protect your eyes from chips or debris. Make sure the blade is in good shape and securely fastened to the handle, and that the handle isn't cracked or damaged. A cracked or damaged handle could allow the head to turn. That could mean you don't strike a square blow and that sharp head could glance off into your leg or foot. There's an art to using a spike maul properly. An art designed to make sure that the head of the maul meets the spike head squarely and evenly. Be certain no one is close enough to you to be hit on the backswing. To start the spike, hold it so your fingers cannot be struck by the maul and tap it into position. Don't use a cracked or broomed maul head. See the difference? Make sure you hit the head of the spike evenly. Watch what can happen if you don't. Watch it. That's not safe. By striking the spike head squarely, there's little chance of the maul glancing off and hurting somebody. Notice the square hit you get when you keep the maul handle even with the rail. Notice how smooth the operation is. Nearly effortless and safe. Everything that goes for the spike maul and the adds goes for the pick and sledge. Make sure that the head and handle are in good shape. And be very sure there's no one too close when you're swinging. Probably the most important thing about using a claw bar is to make sure that the claw end is placed securely under the head of the spike so that it won't slip. claw end won't fit properly under the spike, pry up on the tie plate to loosen the spike using the chisel end of the bar. Notice that you stand beside the bar, not in back of it, and that the footing is secure so you won't fall flat when the spike comes clear. Notice that the hands grip the bar a safe distance from the end. If the spike lets go suddenly, you won't smash your hands on the opposite rail. No way. That's not safe. Lethal! Help! Lethal! Help! Lethal! Help! Lethal! Help! Lethal! Help! When using a lining bar, use it the right way. Let the pressure on the bar come from your arms, shoulders, and legs. 
If you sit on it or straddle it, you're asking for painful problems. That's why sitting or straddling is absolutely prohibited. Place the bar well under the rail so it won't slip. Many a man has been hurt because he put the end of a bar through a bolt hole to turn a rail. Stop right there. That's not safe. This is a good way to hurt yourself badly. A rail fork is the best way to turn rail. The correct way to do it is from behind the rail so that you turn it away from you. Why? If the rail should roll toward you, it could catch your foot beneath it. If the track wrench you're using doesn't have good square jaws, it throw you. A little thing like that could give you big problems. Problems that you don't need. And remember that a wrench is a wrench. It's not to be used as a hammer. Wait a second. That's not safe. Good safety practices mean a safer job done. Take this piece of air hose on the end of a chisel, for example. Make sure it's there to protect you from flying steel splinters. Don't forget the goggles. The man holding the chisel faces the rail. The man with the sled stands beside the rail facing the chisel. Watch out for the safety of other men around you when you swing that sled. There are a couple of things to check about tie tongs to make sure they're able to do the job properly. First, make sure that the points are well sharpened so that the tongs won't lose their grip on the tie. And second, make sure the pivot pin is in good shape so it won't shear, or so that looseness won't cause the tie to drop on a foot or make you lose your balance. One foot behind the other means you won't lose your balance if the tongs lose their grip. And remember that you're not Superman. If the job is too heavy for you, or if any job is too heavy for you, get help. It takes teamwork to lift and carry a heavy section of rail with rail tongs. As when lifting any heavy object, avoid jerking or lifting from twisted positions. Bend the knees, keep the back straight, and watch your footing. When using rail tongs, make sure the pivot pin is in good shape. And there's something else to remember. The proper position for the rail tong is beneath the head, not on the web. Grip the tongs with both hands. At about 136 pounds per yard, you don't want a length of rail landing on your feet. And look before you move. Remember that one man is in charge. One man says when to lift and when to set down. That way, there's no confusion about who does what when. The track jack is a slightly more complicated piece of equipment used to lift sections of heavy track. Once the track is at the desired height, remove the jack handle so there is no possibility of accident. If there is material to be cleared from underneath the rail, keep your hands well clear. Stop. That's not safe. Do it the smart way. Use a stick to clean beneath the rail. Get in the clear! Enough said. When you lower the jack by notching it down, Keep your fingers away from the teeth. 
When you lay the jack down, make sure that dirt or gravel won't get into the teeth. And never oil or grease the paw or teeth. That's just asking for it to slip and crush something. Keep your feet and fingers in the clear all the time, just in case. Here's a rail puller expander in action. There's also a hydraulic type useful for longer sections of welded rail. As you know, this equipment moves rail joints apart or pulls them together, depending upon what is needed. Notice the proper way to operate the bar. Stand clear in case the ratchet slips. Out of force in this tool, always remove the handle when tension is complete. It takes heat and a lot of pressure to put a bend in a section of rail. Rail benders, both hydraulic and screw types, apply the kind of leverage it takes to form a rail to the proper shape. A heavy cable on top of the machine protects the operator in case the mechanism slips under pressure. Be sure it's firmly hooked in place. Power tools associated with railroading have their own set of rules for safe operation. When you're cutting rail with a power rail saw, put a block under the rail to prevent a bind. Make your adjustments before you start the machine, or stop it if changes are necessary. When you're dealing with power equipment, keep your hands away from moving parts. Different rail weights require different adjustments for the saw. Remember, never make adjustments while the engine is running. There's a rule that applies to all power cutting tools. They must not be pressured to cut too fast. Take it easy and you'll save time and equipment. Stop right there. That's not safe. Never, but never refuel an engine while it's running. Stop the tool and be certain you're at a safe distance from open fires or other personnel. Most all handheld power tools have something in common. They all buck when they're turned on. So make sure you have a good grip on them. Otherwise, they might get away from you and cause a painful injury. Don't do it. That's not safe. Never attach the socket to the shaft with a nail. That can tear up a hand in a couple of seconds. Use the correct pin. Move the pin guard in place. Power tools used carelessly have the potential of doing serious injury. Use them safely, and they'll help you do your job the way it should be done. Here's another important point. If you're ever in doubt about the proper use of any piece of equipment, check your supervisor, your safety book, or an old head who can tell you the safe way. You're doing a big job, an important one. How safely you do your job determines how well and healthy you stay. Remember, a team effort keeps the railroad running smoothly. A railroad yard is usually a busy place. Engines moving in both directions. Cars of all different shapes and sizes, yarded, switched,
made up into trains. There are other times when nothing moves. Just like a miniature railroad waiting for someone to put the power on. A yard is a place of sound. Steel hitting steel, rolling wheels, whistles and bells. You've got to be alert, to work carefully, to think and act safely. Don't be a dummy. Being a dummy in a yard can be fatal. Working with equipment this size and shape requires certain skills, a sense of timing, coordination, and rhythm. Well, you can get into all sorts of trouble if you don't know how to work around railroad equipment and how to do it safely. Listen and watch well, so that you'll know and remember the proper way of getting on and off moving equipment safely. Here he makes several mistakes, mistakes that could have caused serious injuries. First, he isn't prepared to board. He isn't paying attention to his work. Then he boarded with the wrong foot. Here, he just plain got careless and put his foot through the stirrup. Always look in the direction of movement. To see that the way is clear of obstacles. Don't board on the wrong side of a switch or it'll trip you up. Board with only one hand and you'll probably get bounced into the car like this. Now let's board the car the right way. It's really a continuous movement. Place two hands on the ladder as quickly as possible. Hold with a firm grip. Immediately, your foot goes into the corner of the stirrup for firm footing. If the cut of cars is approaching from your left, you step your left foot into the left corner of the stirrup. Always board the leading end of the car. If the equipment approaches from your right, you put your right foot into the right corner of the stirrup. If you're just beginning, make sure you grab the ladder with both hands and watch that foot into the stirrup. If you miss or slip, you'll have both hands holding onto the ladder. If you think the car is moving too fast, take the safe course. Don't board it. All right, you're on the car. You're safe if you keep a firm grip on the ladder, and if you remember where you are. You're in a good, safe position. Time to relax. Well, not completely. 
If you're riding for any distance, you can remove the strain on your arms by placing one arm higher than the other. Be comfortable. But watch for unexpected movements. While on any type of equipment, either standing or moving, always, but always, be prepared for an unexpected movement from either direction. Here's a man who doesn't have a firm hold. One jolt, and where would he land? Suppose the pin lifter handle gave way here. Occasionally, somebody who designed a track constructor estimated that all railroaders were thin men. So be alert for insufficient clearance either permanent or temporary. Getting off equipment has its own set of rules. Watch this man. First of all, the equipment was moving too fast for safety. How fast is too fast? If you're unsure that you can get off safely, then it's too fast. And finally, you stepped off with the wrong foot. Getting off on the forward or leading foot turns you toward the moving equipment. And then he dropped off near a switch stand. Now, let's do it the right way. Face the direction of movement. Get your trailing foot near the ground, forward of your body. Let the foot contact the ground. At the same time, let go with the leading hand so you swing away from the car. The other foot comes out of the stirrup. As it touches, let go with your other hand. No herky-jerky movements. Each movement flows into the next. Watch the good balance of this man as he dismounts. Remember, never dismount a car or engine that's moving too fast. Signal for a slowdown. Then wait until the speed is right. Let's do that again. Face the direction of movement. Place your foot near the ground, forward of your body. Step off. Let go with the leading hand. The other foot comes out of the stirrup. When it touches, and you've made your move safely. Let's try it again. Step off with the trailing foot. Let go with the leading hand. Down with the other foot, and let go. Now, some things to remember about different types of equipment. Always, but always, board a caboose at the rear. Don't carry anything that would interfere with getting aboard safely. Never use the footboards on engines. Always board or ride the side steps. Slap the trailing foot into the step. Board flat cars only when absolutely necessary. When you have a choice, avoid boarding flat cars. Once again, let's review boarding a car. Both hands grab the ladder. Left foot into the left corner of the stirrup. Both hands grab the ladder. Right foot into the right corner of the stirrup. Dismount with your trailing foot first. Make sure the area is clear for your footing. The things you have observed are the results of years of good railroading. They've been made into rules that are meant to be remembered and obeyed at all times. Be 
alert. Always stay in the clear of adjacent tracks. If you're not sure you're in the clear, check first. When you can't board or dismount safely, stop the train. Here's a little hint. Never put your arm through the handle of the lantern. Place your thumb over the handle like this. Then you can use it when you're ready. In your years with Santa Fe, you'll board and dismount cars thousands of times. The important thing to remember is to remember. Act carefully each and every time you board or leave a moving car. Don't take chances to gain a few seconds. Work with the clock, not against it. You're not in a race. It only takes an extra 18 seconds to slow down a fast moving string of cars to save speed. Running for a switch can save you three seconds. It takes five seconds to do it right. Fifteen seconds to walk back to a switch you passed. Twenty-two seconds to stop and remove debris. Twelve seconds to gain twelve extra feet of distance around a string of cars. If you add all the time lost in one day by doing things the safe way, you may have lost 120 seconds, maybe 240 seconds, or maybe five minutes. But then you may not be losing these seconds, because 50% of the time you've been cutting the corner on safety, or not paying attention, and saving only a handful of seconds. Then comes one day, just like any other day, when maybe somebody takes his first chance. And it doesn't save a second. 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one second. Count the seconds next time you take a chance. It may be your last. Santa Fe has a tradition of finding better ways to move the flanged wheel over the steel rail. Using today's technology to prepare for tomorrow's challenges, research experts continue searching for ways to maintain Santa Fe's position as a leader in the railroad industry. There have been many innovations to improve train performance. For example, Santa Fe now has laid over 5,000 miles of continuous welded rail. Regular 39-foot rails are welded into lengths about a quarter mile long and hauled to location aboard special trains. The new rail flexes like spaghetti as it's put into place. Looking toward improved maintenance procedures, Santa Fe has developed a sophisticated inspection vehicle called a track geometry car. Utilizing highly sensitive measuring devices, this car constantly monitors and records 10 different track characteristics. 
The latest mechanical engineering techniques are used to design and construct modern equipment to meet the shipping needs of today's industry. Keeping trains running safely and efficiently over the railroad is a continuing challenge. Santa Fe has specialized staffs who concern themselves with the physical and technical problems and potentials in rail operation. There have been some operating challenges requiring research. In fact, in 1974, there were 12 high-speed derailments involving empty cars. 12 derailments demanded reinvestigation to find some common denominators. Of course, a thorough investigation had followed each accident. Cumulative results suggested some directions for further study. From accident reports, it was difficult to pinpoint the problem. There was no explanation for the unusual phenomena of rail cant in tangent track, particularly when the track involved was welded rail known to have excellent surface and alignment quality. An analysis of the derailments revealed four common factors. Number one, the derailments all occurred at high speed. The average speed at time of accident was 66 miles per hour. Number two, the derailments were all caused by rail canting or mounting rail. Number three, the car which triggered the derailment, that is the culprit car, was an empty in each case. Number four, Many occurred in areas where blowing sand is a problem. As a result of these findings, it was decided to run instrumented tests over a stretch of excellent trackage, but where derailments had occurred. The tests were run with a six-car consist, powered with two EMD SD45 locomotives. Accelerometers were to measure lateral acceleration on each car along with displacement transducers to measure rotation of truck. Television cameras were mounted beneath the cars for monitoring the truck and wheel movements during high-speed runs. Controls and recording equipment were located in a special test car. The results were significant and illuminating. Violent truck hunting tendencies were noted at speeds over 55 miles per hour with empty cars. Sulfur cars require greater speed restrictions. The violence of the truck hunting tendencies was found to be directly related to speed, increasing as speed increased. This is particularly true with empty cars. Hunting threshold and hunting intensity are clearly speed related. These tests clearly show that the hunting forces increase as the speed increases. 27, speed is 50 miles an hour. At 50 miles per hour, truck hunting is minimal. The speed is 60 miles an hour. Truck hunting increases, and the wheel flange begins to climb the edge of the rail at 60 miles per hour. Post 720, speed is 70 miles an hour. At 70 miles per hour with empty cars, truck hunting is severe, and oscillation of the bolsters is noticeable. In contrast, the truck hunting threshold is raised and the intensity is significantly decreased when a car is loaded. The thresholds were raised as much as 20 miles per hour with loaded cars. Videotapes were reviewed by the research staff, and instrumentation recordings were studied. Based upon the accumulated evidence, a report was prepared which included recommended operating procedures. The report indicates that recent operating speed restrictions for empty cars is indeed merited until higher speed truck hunting is controlled. Speed restrictions of 35 miles per hour are applied at blow sand areas, since blowing sand contributes to truck hunting. Careful consideration of the report by Santa Fe operating experts resulted in an operating bulletin outlining speed limits and restrictions. Freight trains handling one or more empty cars are limited to 55 miles per hour. Cabooses and cars loaded with empty trailers or empty containers are considered loads. Loaded or empty unit sulfur trains are limited to 35 miles per hour. 
Making the railroad safe for everyone is a big job. It takes every man doing his job thoroughly, carefully, all the time. Your safety and that of your crew depend upon your compliance with the special speed restrictions that are in force on your division. Barstow, California, a nerve center where 4,000 freight cars are handled every 24 hours. A $50 million electronic sorting marvel, and it's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. the Santa Fe Railway, all of it, as of 8 a.m. today. It's the Motive Power Distribution Center in Chicago. And nothing moves on the Santa Fe until these men, the operations planners, make it happen. They make the decisions that speed oranges from Fresno, California to Newton, Kansas, automobiles from Detroit to San Diego, wheat from Wichita to Houston. Here, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, they assign the power. The diesel locomotives that pull freight to its destinations smoothly, without delay. Okay. 8 a.m., these men have a new tool, one that will make Santa Fe service more efficient, flexible, and dependable than ever. It is the new yard at Barstow, California. Barstow Yard, Santa Fe's nerve center in the desert, a vital hub on the railroad's 12,500-mile system. We wanted a facility that would make our California operations smooth and more efficient, and to improve our shipping, service between California points and virtually every other point on the railroad. Of course, that means better service with connecting railroads throughout the country. Barstow really means increased reliability and the ability to do things that we weren't able to do before. Geographically, Barstow is the ideal situation for the Santa Fe operation. It's a junction point from our line from the east all the way from Chicago. And at Barstow, it branches out to Southern California and Northern California, which provides an ideal situation for classifying the cars for three different directions. We've been talking building this yard since the 1950s, and various studies have been made to verify the fact that this was the place we wanted to build it. And what you're looking at here is uh, what most of the construction site looked like prior to the time we made a few changes. We had a lot of problems in Barstow. The, from an engineering standpoint, it was very interesting and challenging to be here. We had the sand to contend with, Mojave River on the north. We had to make allowance for flash floods running off from the hills to the north. And it was quite a task. They excavated and moved five million yards of desert sand. They built two miles of protective dikes. Cut 600,000 cubic yards of rock, crushed it, and used it for track ballast.
laid 113 miles of welded rail over the five-mile-long, 600-acre complex. Go requires an ultra-modern communications network, including signal systems, 10 radio base stations, 33 data circuits, a 400-line automatic telephone plant, and 100 portable pack sets. Barstow plan incorporated special protection for the delicate ecology of the desert, too. They planted nearly 20,000 trees, hundreds of shrubs, two miles of ground cover. There's irrigation. And finally, the structures for the people who will make the yard go. Today is the nerve center in the desert, the Barstow Yard. And here's the quarterback of the Barstow team, the operations planner. There's an operations planner on duty 24 hours a day in the high tower at Barstow. He's the man who has a complete picture of everything happening and about to happen in the yard. Uh, it looks like a load of autos first out there, right? Yeah. It'll leave on a 3245 tonight about 11. 4,000 freight cars move in and out of Barstow, George. counting both in and outbound movements on about 75 freight trains every 24 hours. Track on that 883. Uh, and then call that 876 right behind you. tracks allows trains to arrive and depart simultaneously. Trains can also bypass the Barstow facilities for direct routing to other destinations. Thousands of cars a day, inspected, recorded, handled, serviced, grouped into trains and sped on their way. Information on all trains due to arrive in the next 12 hours, as well as the status on all trains currently in the yard, is stored in the terminal computer. The planner has this information at his fingertips. The TV display shows him the cars due or on hand in various parts of the yard, number of cars bound for each specific destination and the status and assembling progress of outbound trains. With this data, the operations planner can route the cars through the classification to departure. He's in constant touch with supervisors, foremen, and yardmasters in the yard, as well as with other key points across the system. A train arrives from Northern California, the cars in random order, some bound for Texas points, some for Kansas, some for New Mexico, some for Southern California, others for Colorado points. Barstow's job is to classify these cars, to block them into trains headed for destinations along a common route, and to do it quickly and efficiently. The operations planner gives it a priority for the classification yard. I'll master to the high tower. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Norman, I'll be humping uh, R1 next. I got Louis Estrada up there against it. Let's go. Okay, and uh, next uh, will be R9, if that's all right with you. That's fine. That's uh, 968, kind of warm -ish anyway. Four computers control the classification. They send the cars to their assigned tracks, any of the 44 main tracks in the Barstow yard. 
controlling the switches, and the car speeds automatically. From there on, gravity powers the cars. The computers and automatic controls weigh them, transmit weight information to the retarders, operate the switches, measure the car's rollability, and slow the cars to the precise speeds for good coupling. That's as far as most freight classifying yards go. But Barstow goes one important step further. Because at Barstow, there's a mini hump to reclassify the cars. Why reclassify the cars? It may be that after the initial sorting or classification of cars, you have 16 cars going to eight different points along the same route. Here's where the mini hump takes over. The mini hump conductor receives a list from the computer telling him which car is to be shoved to each track. In just two moves, he puts the cars in station order in the train. This means that the cars bound for the first destination stop along the route will be put at the front of the train and the cars for the next stop will be next. So when the train arrives at a station, the cars are dropped off in order, and the train can go on with less delay. Barstow's mini hump helps traffic flow more smoothly all through the Santa Fe system. Barstow is more than just a big electronic sorting machine. Every engine that comes through Barstow gets a thorough going over. Nearly 100 units every 24 hours. Uh, yeah, did you get that change on that 5673? I wanted in five on top of the 4600, please. Uh -huh. 451 Garcia. Yeah, Anita, uh, give me some inspections to do on this 901. From his tower command post, the supervisor controls all phases of diesel servicing and dispatching. Uh, 5917. 5917. The good turn, car date the 30th. This new inspection repair service facility is like huge outdoor clinic where the mechanical health of each incoming locomotive is examined. And it's quite a checkout. Running gear, engine, electrical system, car body, air gauges tested. Then the diesels are fueled, sanded, lubricated, restocked. Finally, everyone goes through the automatic washer. water is treated, cleaned, and purified. Are we going to need to uh, take these lugs off, or do you think we can build these up? Barstow's car service facility is a railroading man's dream. It's a one-spot facility, 
cars needing repair are brought to the servicing men and equipment. Here, they can make wheel changes, repair draft gears and couplers, replace body center plates, and carry out the most exacting inspections, handling up to 78 cars and 12 truck changes a day. So cars coming through Barstow are not only kept moving to their destinations more efficiently, but they leave in good shape. Barstow, like the rest of the railroad, is an around-the-clock operation. Okay. Better service, reliability, performance. From the power distribution room in Chicago to this new yard at Barstow, California. Barstow and facilities like it have helped Santa Fe deliver for its customers. And that means they help put fresh fruits, vegetables, and other food products into our homes at a remarkably low transportation cost. These facilities and the men and women of the railroad make it possible to ship packaged food products, for example, for an average of just half a cent a pound. Barstow Yard, a desert nerve center, the latest investment for better transportation service. From the railroad always on the move, toward a better way. My name is Louis Chinoffi. I'm a switchman in the Los Angeles yard. This is our new television set. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it, Lily? But do you remember the one they delivered all smashed up? Do I remember? I'll never forget it. We'd invited a whole group of friends over to help us celebrate. I baked a cake and made sandwiches, and no television set. And I was going to be allowed to stay up late. But when it came all broken up, I had to go to bed. Let me tell you the whole story. It started on payday, a couple of months ago. Now, paydays are always special, but this one was extra special. Lily and I had been setting aside money for a television set. The dealer had ordered it two weeks before, and a big bite of this check would finish the deal. I told the boys, this is the check that buys that 21-inch console. And off I went to meet Lily and cash the check. Leaving Lily and our girl Betty stocking up at the supermarket for the big night, I went to pay for the set. The man said that the set was down at the freight house, and he'd send his delivery truck to pick it up and bring it direct to my house. I suppose after you have a set a while, you get used to television. But for us, this was still a big day. I went to pick up Lily and Betty, and we went home to wait for the set to come. Betty was all excited. Every kid on the block knew we were getting the set. Lily and I were almost as bad. We had invited half the neighborhood to help us celebrate. We sat around waiting anxiously. I kept one eye on my watch and one on the door as I tried to read my paper. Later that afternoon, it finally came. I heard a truck and looked out the front door. Sure enough, it was our set. It's here, I yelled. I helped the fellow get his hand truck up the front steps and steered him carefully through the door and into the living room. The big moment had arrived. We were all gathered around to look at our new prize possession. I set it down here, I told the man, and he did. Hey, what are all these holes in the carton? What'd you do to my set? Search me, said the fellow. That's the way they gave it to me at the freight house. If there's anything wrong, the people at the Santa Fe did it. We opened the carton. And you can imagine how we felt when this is what we saw. What a mess. 
It looked like somebody shoved it off the rim of Grand Canyon. There'll be no celebration tonight. The big day turned out to be a big bust. The next day, I put them all away like they had eggs in them. I couldn't get the picture of that television set out of my mind. But to tell you the truth, what was really eating on me was a crack one of the neighbors made. He said, how do you guys keep your customers if you deliver stuff like that? Well, how do you answer a question like that? What about the folks in Chicago who made the set? Why should they keep shipping Santa Fe? There sure must be a lot of delicate work in making a television set. All the wires and tubes and connections. The manufacturers must get mad at us if we rough up that big picture tube and those expensive cabinets. And if his dealers complain that we smash some of their sets, wouldn't he start thinking about shipping them some other way? And as long as I'm asking questions, let me ask another. How did a set that left the factory in perfect shape like this get all banged up when it was turned over to us? I don't know the answer to that question exactly, but I could guess at a lot of things that could have happened. You don't work for Santa Fe for 17 years without hearing about loss and damage and seeing some of the things that cause it. The damage could start right here at the freight house. It's checked in and headed for the tow van. Maybe the stowman is a fellow who usually does a good job, but when he takes this load for his block, he may not be keeping his mind on his work. Maybe he was still thinking of something else when he stowed it in the rough freight end of the car. Don't ask me what he was thinking about when he did this. Maybe that's how it started. I don't know. Maybe he stowed it right. Anyway, the car with my set in it is in a cut headed for the train yard. Well, a lot of things can happen in the yard. For example, the foreman says, I got two for four. Without checking the room, the field man says, let him come. Kick, says the foreman. There they go. And the fieldman looks. Too late. It won't hold him. Maybe that smashed it. Could be. Or maybe a foreman says, cut one. The one with my set in it. Kick, he says. And then he starts to wonder what his next cut is. He studies his list too long, and the cars go faster and faster. Hey, says the pin puller. Hey! Oh, says the foreman, waking up. Stop! Stop! But he kicked him too hard. They're going down a well, and there's nothing he can do about it. Hold your ears. There goes my picture tube. Maybe it didn't happen in the yard. Maybe it happened on the road. Maybe some engine man grabbed her by the neck and took off in too big a hurry. He gathers up the slack in a rush, and my set takes another wallop. Maybe that didn't get the whole job done, but every little bit helps. If it didn't happen starting, it could have happened stopping. A fella can get in as big a hurry coming into town as getting out. And when he sets the nose of the diesel down like this, he can really break up the china. When they were making up the train again, maybe the fieldman was standing out where he could relay the foreman's signals around the curve. The reason I think of this is I did it once myself. Up comes Joe and yells, Hey, Ernie, you going to the ball game tonight? So they start jabbing, like I did. Meanwhile, the foreman thinks they're getting his sign until he sees nothing's happening. Joe and Ernie had the ball game all figured out, 
But they sure missed the sign on this pitch. With nobody relaying his signal, the foreman goes down swing. You sure feel silly, don't you? Like I say, lots of things can happen in a yard. The crew rides the engine right by the joint they're going to make without dropping a man off to make the coupling. They tie on to the first cut in the track. They'll make this one all right. But what about the other? You must be going to shove blind. Yep. Go back and get him, the pin puller says. But look at this. Here's an engine working on the lead at the other end of the yard. Well, they're trusting to luck with the pin drop. It didn't make, and they're off to the other end. Their luck ran out. It always does sooner or later. Suppose some other fella goes after a switch with the wheels close to the point. We could have told him he didn't have time to make that one. Well, those are some of the things that could have happened. What actually did happen, we'll never know. But somehow, somebody really smashed up that television set. Maybe it was you. Maybe it was me. We've all pulled bones. A fella's wife might say it must have been somebody else. But we know better. You know, Lewis, I've just been thinking. If all the Santa Fe employees worked as carefully as you, we wouldn't have had as much trouble getting that first set. Honey, I hate to say this, but it could have been me that wrecked it. Remember when I met you and Betty at the supermarket? The day I paid for the set. Now, I know a fellow's wife thinks he does his work just right. And most of the time, we do. But remember when we were shopping for the big party that didn't happen, and I decided I wanted some applesauce? Remember when you said, oh, I don't want an old dented up can? It struck me funny that, of all people, a switchman's wife would turn down a dented can. But now, after the broken set and that question, how do you keep your customers when you deliver that kind of stuff, maybe it isn't so funny. Maybe if we could look inside that car when we switch it, we'd always handle it the way it should be. And never let it hit like this. One smack like that, and you end up with a couple of tons of canned goods that nobody wants. When it gets to the man who ordered it, he blows his top, and he says to the Santa Fe man, what do you fellas do with this stuff? Play baseball with it? It looks as though that's what you do, he says. I don't know what the Santa Fe man says when he looks at that pile of junk, but I'd hate to be in his shoes. And I guess it's the same way with delay as it is with damage. Somebody ordered this lumber, and I guess they're waiting for it. But that wallop it got is sure going to hold it up. Come to think of it, I suppose somebody's waiting for all those shifted loads I see sitting around on the rip track. No question that most of us do a pretty fair job most of the time. We have our mind on the job, and we're doing the job right. Oh, there may be a few who aren't, but most of the things that go wrong come from unintentional mistakes. Now, this won't do the journal any good, but it sure took the squeak out of Sam's shoe. Of course, Sam's partner discovered his mistake and oiled the box. But suppose he hadn't. Maybe this could have happened. There's one smoking, the brakeman says. Hot box! Hot box! Stop her, says the conductor. We've got a hot one. At best, a train load of perishables is going to be standing still while they fix the box. And if the brakeman hadn't spotted it when he did, he might even have a train in the ditch. 
Even I can figure out that fellas who ship perishables don't like any kind of delay. It's that question again of how do we keep our customers if we don't do our job right? It's the same deal with livestock. They're perishable, too. Delay can shrink them. And if we don't feed them and water and rest them when we should, it's a cinch they don't get to market in good condition. And, of course, nobody wants to rough-handle livestock. We handle a lot of cattle in California, but we don't see too many grain cars. It's the boys in the Middle West who really move grain during the harvest. They tell me that you can inspect a car from top to bottom before you cart it for grain. And you can put up a grain door that's really grain tight. But it don't mean a thing if you let it hit at seven or eight miles an hour. That's still gonna put the grain on the ground. I pull a boner today you pull one tomorrow, and when you add up all the damage, it fills a couple of three warehouses. They've got everything you can think of in there. Stoves, water heaters, refrigerators, all of it's damaged in one way or another. This is all merchandise refused by our customers. You look at it, and the question the fellow asks really sinks in. How do you keep your customers when you deliver stuff like this? You know, Santa Fe isn't the only way to ship. A shipper has his choice of railroad. He picks the one that does the best job. Truck lines are after our business every day of the week. And they don't need men to switch cars. Airlines, with their air freight, are moving heavier and heavier items all the time. The day when railroads had a monopoly on the freight business is long since past. We get new customers and keep old ones by meeting and beating competition. We must be meeting competition. I see an awful lot of freight moving on our line. Like I said, most of us must be doing right most of the time. We must be checking the freight in carefully, making sure the count is right, making sure the merchandise is in good order. 95% of the time, we must be stowing it right, putting it in the right end of the car. We must be bulkheading it tight so the load won't shift and damage the merchandise that we carry. When the foreman says he's got two for five, most fieldmen are on their toes, like this one. If there isn't room, we shove. And most of us give good, clear signals like this. Or, like the easy sign this man has given, not weak little motions that an engineman 20 car lengths away has to strain his eyes to see. From what I know, 95% of us, and maybe more, take pride in being good at our job. It takes know-how to gather up the slack slow and easy and get off to a good start. In fact, it takes a lot of know-how to be a first-class railroad man no matter what your job is. And we all take pride in doing a job the way it should be done. You know, when you think about it long enough, maybe it's not so hard to answer that question about preventing loss and damage and keeping our customers. When we work together, we're a team that's hard for any competition to beat. Preventing loss and damage boils down to a pretty simple thing. If I did a little better, and you did a little better, I bet we'd get the job done. Louis Janoffy is right. The men on the Santa Fe are doing a good job. It's a question, as Louis says, of doing just a little better in preventing loss and damage. We can all take pride in the overall performance of Santa Fe. For example, some shipments come to us like this, obviously improperly loaded or perhaps rough handled en route. In the course of a year, 150,000 tons are reloaded here. The merchandise is properly stowed and bulkheaded so that the load will ride safely to its destination and reach the customer on schedule and in good order. Preventing loss and damage is not only a matter of every man doing a little better, but of providing proper facilities. 
With a modern hump yard like this, Santa Fe provides the shipper with fast, careful handling of his freight. The hump yard master receives teletype consist of train and directs overall operation from his tower on the crest of the hump. Thousands of cars go over the hump daily and on into the classification track. Cuts of a hundred cars or more may be shoved to the hump in one continuous movement to be switched into numerous different tracks. From his tower, the retarder operator lines the switches and controls the speed of the cars through a series of electronically controlled car retarders. Cars for all points reached by Santa Fe and for connecting lines move over the hump in a steady stream. The Argentine hump, like the enlarged and improved Belen Yard, is part of the great building program, which is making Santa Fe America's new railroad. Construction is going apace as new tower yard offices are completed, providing an overall view of the yard. Communication is constantly being improved with the latest electronic equipment. New yard leads, new tracks, new rails are being laid. Curves are being clipped, grades reduced. Giant icing machines fill reefer bunkers with five tons of ice in 60 seconds. Another reason why we call Santa Fe America's new railroad. Progress that pays its own way. Route of the chief, the super chief, El Capitan, moving millions of tons of freight across mountain and prairie, Santa Fe is one of the great traffic arteries of the nation. Yet its richest resource is the loyalty and skill of its 65,000 employees who are building with Santa Fe a secure future for themselves and their families. In the conscientious efforts of Santa Fe people to improve freight service, to reduce loss and damage, is found the key to their own future through the ever-increasing ability of Santa Fe to serve the nation. Down the tracks of progress come the paydays of tomorrow. train inbound from Los Angeles. 25 of them will go to Chicago, 37 to points east of Chicago, and the remainder will be delivered locally. How these cars, 83 out of 3,100 that arrive daily, get sorted and reformed into new trains at Santa Fe's new computer-controlled freight yard outside of Kansas City is our story. The Argentine Yard, a design for tomorrow. The Argentine Yard is the hub of 13,000 miles of Santa Fe transcontinental freight network. Understanding what happens there is not complicated. Our train came in here, 83 cars bound for Chicago and different destinations. The Argentine Yard is a sorting machine for putting trains together. At the Argentine Yard, cars get switched and it's all done by a computer. Automated Argentine. When the train comes in, the engine is pulled off. And now it's no longer a train, just a string of cars going somewhere else. Our string of cars moves down the track. It divides, divides again, and again, and again, until there are 48 different tracks that hold nearly 1,800 cars. Each leads to a different destination. Before our train arrived at the Argentine yard, a list of its cars and their destination came in from Los Angeles over microwave after editing and processing by computer. Now it's a question of sorting the car. Okay. 
The yard master asks the terminal data computer for information. He's given a complete list of all the cars and where each will go. At the same time, the computer calls up another computer, the hump computer, and gives it the same list. Now, the main job the hump computer has is matching the correct car to the correct track. From that second on, until each of the cars is sorted and made up into new trains, the entire action is automatic. Eddie will uh, up this list 111D99. Even the engine goes on automatic. Eastbound up to the 937. That's 937. We'll put it in automatic, George. Oh, yeah, it in Oddly enough, the whole computer yard uses a very simple principle, gravity. An engine nudges the cars over the hill or hump one by one, and from there on, gravity and the computer work together. computer sets all the switches so gravity can take each of the cars to its proper track. All the cars that are going to Chicago line up on the Chicago tracks. Those going on east of Chicago wind up on those tracks. Those for local delivery go to their track. must move faster than four miles per hour when it couples. Yet a carload of oranges weighs less than a carload of steel. So measuring devices feed the computer information about car weight, height, rolling characteristics. Radar measures the speed. The computer already knows that each of the 48 tracks has different characteristics. Some are fast, some are slow, some have long curves, some are nearly straight. Each has its own personality, 
and the computer knows and remembers them all. All this information is processed and evaluated in a blink. And then the computer sets special brakes, called retarders, to prevent the cars moving at more than four miles per hour coupling speed. Now the 25 cars are on their way to Chicago, and the 37 to points east of Chicago. And the remainder move out for local delivery. The busy hump computer checks again to make sure that everything is in line. Then it automatically sends an as hump list to the terminal data center, which maintains a complete listing of all the cars in the yard. Then it clears its own memory and gets ready for the next string of cars to be sorted into other trains. 60 miles to the west in Topeka, Kansas, is the computer center that gathers and stores information about car movements. When our train was coming in from the coast, it received an advanced list of cars. The computer center in Topeka is in charge of keeping the list of cars up to date. While our train was bound in from the coast, perhaps cars were added and cars removed. So lists of these cars and their numbers their contents and destinations are fed into Topeka, which in turn sends that information on to the terminal data center in Kansas City. Unless we can be sure that the computer information gets through, it is valueless. Thus, we have a network of microwave and landline communication systems to ensure that the message is delivered. Think of the communication center located at Topeka as a giant computer-controlled switchboard staffed by experts whose job it is to make sure that all communication channels are operating. This is CTC. <coughs> We've got our high-speed circuit tested out to Argentine, and we're ready to use it if you, anytime you want to swap over from the low speed to the high speed. OK, I'll issue a start line to the Argentine circuits. Having reliable communications at our disposal is of vital importance. This is critical because the computer center talks with nearly 500 strategically located terminals, gathering information about car movements, their type, cargo, together with their destination. Then all their information is available in a matter of seconds. Red ball. Three oh six nine oh six. All right. Santa Fe three oh six nine oh six arrived Stockton. Twenty one twenty March eleventh on train QSFI. It was loaded. Destin stopped it. Mr. I show ATSF 16127 delivered to FWD Fort Worth 1435 hours March 10th. Here at Argentine, we make direct connections with 12 other railroads that fan out in every direction.
751, come in. Well, we're ready to leave now. Highball, take her east there. You got a high green for Marceline. 3,100 cars a day pass through the Argentine yard, or the equivalent of Santa Fe's entire 80,000 car fleet every 26 days. And now they pass through twice as fast as they used to. In an average year, six oranges for everyone in the United States pass through Argentine. And enough potatoes to provide 100 pounds for everybody in Chicago. A string of piggyback trailers that would cover 1,200 miles of highway, bumper to bumper. And behind it all, behind the new technology, improved communication, the computers and the data information systems, you'll find the people of Santa Fe. It's the key. That's the key to the Santa Fe Railroad. If Argentine does well, the Santa Fe does well. Well, I'd say 90% uh, improvement over anything they've ever had. Because the kind of work railroads have to do is ideally suited to the work computers are best to do it. Simple as one, two, three, when you figure you've got the room, I could, everything goes smoother. Like daylight and dark, uh, what I mean, it's all automatic. And uh, it's easier, a lot easier, a lot. Yes, when you have a dynamic and a fluid operation, such as we have at Argentine, your customer always benefits from improved service people, the Santa Fe people who run the world's fastest freight train, the Super C. Santa Fe, the Super Sea Santa Fe, the Super Sea Santa Fe. 